Good evening, Southside Baptist Church. Welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. It is April the 8th, and I'm going to thank you for joining me. Uh, tonight we're going to be in Genesis chapter 39, so if you have your Bible, go ahead and, and take it out and, and turn to Genesis chapter 39. We'll be in verses 6 through 23. Um, but before I get to that, I want to invite you to pray with me. Certainly, want you. To, I want to ask you to remember our church family, all the many um, members of our church who are confined to home right now because we are in shelter in place. We're in, in the first half week of this two-week ordeal. No doubt by, by now you are maybe experiencing cabin fever, <laughs> uh, ready to get out. But I just want to encourage you today. I just want to encourage you. I want to lift you up in prayer and ask the Lord to bless you and be with you and your whole entire household. I'm praying specifically that that you would not be exposed to this virus, that the Lord would, would protect you from it. However, you may know someone at this point who has personally experienced contamination by the virus, and, and all of a sudden this has become very real to you. Definitely want to remember that person that you know in prayer. Um, and also, like I said, I just want to pray for you. Remember our shut-ins during this particular time. And also, let's pray for our leaders locally, um, statewide, nationally. Let's remember our president, and let's remember um, his staff. But also, let's remember our, our international neighbors. This is a global pandemic, and we all need, um, we, we are a, an international community that needs the Lord for sure. So I just want to invite you to pray with me right now. Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We thank you for being who you are. We're, we are reminded of your sovereignty. We're reminded of your grace and your mercy and your kindness and your goodness. Father, we also are reminded that you alone are the healer, that if our land is to be healed of COVID-19, God, it's going to be because of your grace and mercy and your healing power, not because of anything that man has done. God, it's not by our power that, that we will rescue ourselves from this pandemic. It'll be because of you, because of you, Father, and your power and your great sovereignty and your grace and your mercy. So, Lord, we ask for, for healing. We ask for deliverance. We ask, Lord, that you would remember us, your people. Father, I pray that through this global pandemic that people will turn to you, Father. No doubt they are seeking for truth. And, Lord, I pray that they will find that you are truth. You are love. That in you alone they can find fulfillment. In you alone they can find forgiveness. In you, in you alone they can find an eternal relationship that is the only relationship worth having. So, Father, I just pray right now, God, that you would be glorified through the situation and that you would heal us, Lord. Father, I want to remember our shut-ins. I want to remember our church community right now. I'm lifting each and every single one of them up to you in prayer today and every day, Father, asking that you would be with them in their specific prayer needs. Father, I pray that they would be encouraged during this time, Lord, that that you would just help them to not waste time but to spend time in your word through meditation, through prayer through encouraging one another and just reconnecting. Father, thank you for reconnecting our families. God, for those that we know that have this coronavirus, Lord, we want to lift them up to you in prayer. For names that we're, we're not even aware of, Lord, that are contaminated by this virus, Father, we lift them up to you in prayer. Father, we pray that you would heal their bodies, Father, that you would draw them closer to you, Lord. Father, I, I just... This is this this is something we've never experienced before, Lord. But we definitely want to be be drawn closer to you during the situation. God, for our churches, for our community community of churches that aren't able to gather um, as one body right now, Father, in person, but we can meet over the electronic media. So thank you, Lord, for it. And Father, all the way that, the ways that you're choosing to bless us and to get our attention, Father, right now, um, you've got it. We love you. And Lord, we're paying attention. Now teach us, we pray in your holy name. Amen. So with that, I invite you to open up Genesis chapter 39. We're going to be looking at character. We are defined by our character. However, the one thing that we oftentimes overlook is that our character is a choice. Did you know that? Your character is a choice. The things that you choose determine your character makeup. All right, so in this passage, uh, verses 6 through 23, I want us to specifically look at the character of Potiphar's wife. Unfortunately, we don't know her name. Um, God doesn't, doesn't honor her by giving her name in this passage, but we can glean some things about her character. So let me read the passage of Scripture first, and then we'll come back and we'll look at the seven things that we can learn from, from Mrs. Potiphar. It says, so in verse number 6, I'm going to skip down to the second part of verse number 6. It says, now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. 
It came about after these events, these events meaning that he was sold into Potter, he was sold into slavery. He is now Potiphar's house servant, and he's he he has been blessed by the Lord, and so therefore he has risen in status and position within that house. He is over every everybody else. It says that his master's wife, that would be Mrs. Potiphar, looked with desire at Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, with me here my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he has put all that he owns in my charge. There is no one greater in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great evil and sin against God? And she spoke to Joseph day after day. He did not listen to her to lie beside her or to be with her. Now it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the household was there inside. She caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. When she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled outside, she called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought in a Hebrew to us to make sport of us. He came into me to lie with me, and I screamed. When he heard that I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled and went outside. So she left his garment beside her until his master came home. Then she spoke to him with these words, The Hebrew slave whom you brought to us came into me to make sport of me. And I raised my voice and screamed. He left his garment beside me and fled outside. Now when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke to him, saying, This is what your slave did to me, his anger burned. So Joseph's master took him and put him into the jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the jail. But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. The chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail, so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. All right, so what do we know about jo about Potiphar's wife? Well, we know that she was a wicked woman. She was the kind of woman that you'd want to stay away from. Her characteristic is true of, of, of someone who is constantly thinking, contemplating, and involved in sin and really has no desire to turn from it whatsoever. So what can we glean from her? Seven things. First thing we, we can glean from, from this situation, uh, meaning a person who is continually looking to sin, is this. Mrs. Potiphar had an impressive position. She had an impressive position. She had everything that it takes um, to impress others. She had popularity. She had position. She had possessions. She had power. But she had nothing to impress God. She had nothing to impress God. What is most important in your life? Is it the things that you own? Is it your status? Is it your popularity, the way other people look at you? Or is it your um, relationship with our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ? I mean, I can't tell you that as, or I can't impress upon you enough as a follower of Jesus Christ that my relationship with the Lord trumps everything else that, that I have, everything else that I could possibly be or am. I want to be known as a follower of Jesus Christ. That's it. I want to give glory to Him with, with, with my life. You know, and there's so many examples that, that we could give. When I go out to, to purchase an automobile or, or perhaps you go clothes shopping or something like that, and when, when you're purchasing things to own, are you, are you purchasing those things because you want to impress other people or are you purchasing those things because you want to glorify the Lord? You know, ask yourself that whenever you're taking your credit card, your checkbook, or your cash out of, out of your pocketbook and you're getting ready to, to lay it down and to give it to another for the purchase of something. Is that purchase going to glorify God or, or in some way are you trying to glorify yourself? Uh, it'll definitely curtail your spending or it'll change your, your spending for, for sure. You know, Paul teaches in Galatians chapter 1, verse, verse 10, talking about the importance of, of trying to impress only one with our lives, that one being God. He says this to, to, to the church there. And by the way, the, the church here in, in Galatians that, that Paul is speaking to, they have begun to allow others to come in with a counterfeit gospel, and they are believing in the distortion of the Word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul is speaking to them, and this is no doubt very difficult to have this conversation with brothers and sisters, um, and, and, and he's very authentic with them. And this is what he says. He says, for it, and he informs it in, in a question. He says, for am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would 
not be a bond servant of Christ. In other words, I wouldn't be here speaking truth to you. I would, I would, I would be a people pleaser. I'm not a people pleaser. I'm a God pleaser. So I'm going to speak truth to you, whether you like it or not. You know that's so important that we live our lives. You know, if you have an impressive position, use it to the glory of the Lord. Don't use it in in, in a way for vanity's sake or for self gain. I wanted to show you a picture. Um, and the picture, ah, here it is, it's, it's in the back of my Bible, it's on a bookmark, and I hope you can see this, I, I'm outside, I don't know if you can see that picture, but that is a picture of Charles Kelly, Dr. Chuck Kelly, um, he was the former president of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary when I was in school, but it's not him I want to talk about, it's his wife, Miss Miss Rhonda Kelly, who is right beside him. Miss Rhonda Kelly, uh, being not only a pastor's wife, but also the president's wife, um, the seminary president's wife, you know, she certainly could have sat in the president's mansion or house. She could have sat there and ate bonbons and watched soap operas and, and just wasted her life away while he was seminary president. But she didn't. She was a woman who used her impressive position to inspire other women whose husbands were there at the seminary training to do um, the ministry of God. She encouraged them to get an education while they were there at seminary with their husbands. I mean, she made it available to them. She, she made sure that they had daycare, child care, so that they could go and attend classes. And, and she made the classes flexible. Some of them were offered at night when, whenever the, their husband's um, classes were over so that they could go. But she encouraged them to utilize the gifts that God had blessed them with to the ministry, to the glory of God. Miss, Miss Rhonda Kelly not only um, made, it, made it possible for the women to, to, to gain an education, but she was just an advocate, again, for them to use their position in their churches, out on the mission field, wherever God called them for the glory of God, to always be, um, a, to always be a mouthpiece for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And um, so she was just a very, very special person, Miss Miss Rhonda Kelly. They are both now retired, and um, we have a new president of the seminary now. But they just recently retired last year. Anyways, use if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, use the position that God has given you um, to glorify Him, and not not for vanity's sake or for popularity or any of those or or personal gain, but for the glory of, of the Lord. Number two, for a person that is continually looking to sin, Mrs. Potiphar had a wondering eye. She had a wondering eye. Listen, never think that what we allow ourselves to gaze upon is powerless in our thoughts and in our actions. Uh, in verse number seven, it says that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. She looked at Joseph with, with lust in her heart, is what scripture says there. Now, we can look all throughout scripture, and we'll see some characters. You know, she's not the only one who did this. For example, there was Eve. I mean, well, let's go back to, to the very, uh, the very um, beginning of our, of our Bible. We were introduced to Eve. What Eve looked at the fruit, the forbidden fruit, with lust in her heart, feeling that God was, was holding back something from her. There was something about that fruit that enticed her. So she looked upon it with lust, and she gave in to that, that temptation, and she offered that to, to, to Adam. Lot, same thing. He looks at, at the plain, and he sees how well-watered it is. He, it contains the city of, of Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, very populated, people having fun, and uh, unfortunately, they are engrossed in sin. Um, he being a shepherd, he, he chooses that well-watered plain with those two wicked cities as, as an area in which to, to take his family into, and he does, and of course he, he gets caught up in, in that temptation as well, or his family does. Um, Samson, same thing, uh, falls, for De, falls for Delilah, she's a Philistine, which is, his, which is the enemy of his people. Again, wandering eye, he looks at the beauty instead of... of being obedient to, to God. David, David, a man after God's own heart, uh, is, is up on his rooftop, uh, gazes at Bathsheba. She's taking a bath up on her roof, rooftop, a neighboring um, building, and with lust in his heart, um, he sends for her, lies with her, and she becomes pregnant, and, and there's a whole conspiracy there to get rid of her husband, I mean, it's, it's, it's all because of a wandering eye, whether it's fruit, whether it's a well-watered plain with wicked cities, whether it's a Philistine named Delilah, or whether it's a woman taking a bath named Bathsheba. 
whatever, Miss Potiphar did not control what entered her eyes. It's often said that your eyes are the window to your soul, that what, that what is allowed through your eyes definitely um, has, ha, has a bearing upon your thoughts, and it can certainly, from there, um, curtail your choices, which ultimately shape your character. And that's exactly what, what has happened here. Listen to what Psalm 101, verse 3 says. The psalmist writes, I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. Do you hear that? This is a warning from God I'm written through, through the psalmist. I will set no worthless thing. Something that is a temptation to me, I'm not going to set it before my eyes. He goes on to write this. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not fasten its grip on me. It shall not fasten its grip on me. All right. So if our eyes are the window to our soul, then we need to guard what our eyes look upon. Now, I believe Satan, the enemy, has used um, electronic media. I believe he's used our television. He's used cable. He's used satellite. He's used st streaming. Um, you name it. I believe that is a platform on which on which Satan has used to enter our eyes. Uh, I can cannot fathom the num the number of rated R movies, TV fourteen. Um, you name it. Uh, growing up. You know, we certainly had, you know, Satan was using TV and media to infiltrate our homes, but today I think it is, he's definitely beefed up um, his attack on our, on our homes and ultimately on our hearts. You know, I can remember not, not too long ago, um, I was watching a movie and it had, a, it had disturbing content in it. And I can remember turning it off, but it was too late. That content had already entered through my eyes. Um... Even as I went to bed that night, I prayed. I said, oh, Lord, please remove um, those images from, from, my, from my mind and from my heart. And what is interesting is the next morning when I woke up, you know, because those images had already gotten through my eye gate, the next morning I'm thinking upon those images that I saw. You know, it's, it's, it only takes one glance, and it, and it can really um, destroy, destroy you. But... I say, continue to pray because there is power in prayer, and God will deliver you from that. Um, I don't just tell you that um, because that's my opinion. I tell you that because it's based on the authority of Scripture. Listen to what 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17 says about how we should pray concerning this matter. It says, Do not love the world nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. So how should we pray? We should pray that we do the will of God. Heavenly Father God, help me to, to, to not give in to the lust of the eyes, but Lord, to always be living and desiring obedience to your will and whatever I do. Well, listen to the psalmist in Psalm 119, verse 36. It says this, Incline my heart to your testimonies and do not, and not to dishonest gain. Turn away my eyes from looking at vanity and revive me in your ways. Another way that we can pray. All right, so Mrs. Potiphar had an impressive position. Mrs. Potiphar had a wondering eye. A person who is continually looking to sin will be like Miss Potiphar. In the third way, she had a lustful heart. She had a lustful heart. She actually asked Joseph to come and lie with her, to be immoral. It says in verse 7, she, she, she said, lie down with me. Now, wicked, wicked things in, in, in her mind. I want us to look very quickly at 1 Timothy chapter 6, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And as I read these these verses of scripture, I want um, you to look for a common word. A common word. I think it's going to jump off the pages as, as I read it. So so listen. Listen, listen to this. And, and, and you're listening to the word that God is screaming at us whenever we are faced with temptation. Something we should do. It's an action word. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 11 says this. But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. All right. What things is, is, is Paul talking about there to, to young Timothy? He says, flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love. Well, I think 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22 will give us a little bit of an insight. He says this, now flee from youthful lusts. Okay, there it is, youthful lusts. And pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Right, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. I think it tells us a little bit more about what we should flee from. Flee immorality. Okay, so flee immorality. 2 Timothy says youthful lust. 
All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he goes a little bit further. He says, flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. So flee immorality, fl flee from youthful lust, flee from anything that is not that does not glorify our Lord. Okay, so what is the common word between those three, three verses, the common action word there? It's flee, right? And well, that's the one thing that Mrs. Potiphar didn't do whenever she was tempted by sin, and she did not flee from, from her lustful thoughts and desires. Uh, however, uh, Joseph did. It says, it says that, that he fled, that he ran away from, from the temptation. You know, a lustful heart begins with, begins with our thoughts. It begins with a filthy mind. Um, Thinking about our thought lives, verses that can help us whenever um, whenever we are trying to build a thought life that honors and glorifies the Lord, or I should say discipline our, our thought life that will honor and glorify the Lord, here are some verses that, that we can meditate upon. Philippians uh, chapter 4, verse 8, it says this, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever um, is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is anything excellent, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. How about Second Corinthians chapter ten, verse five? It says, "We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ." I don't know if you've ever had a bad dream. But I want to encourage you, if you have a bad dream, I want to encourage you, if your eyes glance and you happen to see something that, that you're not supposed to see, and you are truly remorseful in seeing it, you're truly remorseful in, 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 in entering into your soul, then, then, then do this. Take that thought captive through prayer. Say, say, Father God, I want to take this thought captive, and, and I want to surrender it to you, Heavenly Father. If you have a bad dream and it wakes you up, Pray right then to God. Say, Heavenly Father God, I want to take that bad dream, those thoughts captive, and I'm going to surrender them to you, Father. And under your sovereignty, ask that you deal with those, and that you would remove them from my life. I tell you what, the Lord will do it. He'll do it every time. How about Psalm 1914? It says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. You are my rock and my redeemer. All right, so some verses that deal with our thought life, some, some verses that we can that we can meditate upon. All right, so what do we know about Miss, Miss Potiphar so far? We know that she had an impressive position. We know that she had a wandering eye. We know that she had a lustful heart. Number four, she had a stubborn will. She would not listen to reason. All right, so she, she looks upon Joseph with desire. She says, lie with me. Um, and then it says in verse 8 that Joseph begins to reason with her. He, be, he says, listen, I can't do this thing. It would be sinning against my master. It would be sinning against my God. Um, I, I just simply cannot do this. But she would not listen to that reason. Now, she's got this, this, this young, she has this good-looking servant um, standing before her saying no. No doubt that had to be difficult for, for her to listen uh, because at this point she has bathed herself in, in, in her own pride and in her, her own position and power. But um, she would not listen uh, even when, when Joseph is pleading with her to change her ways. The question that I think of is, is, is there an area of my life, is there an area in your life where you are refusing to surrender to the will of the Lord and you are holding on with your own stubborn pride and your own stubborn will. You know, what God calls stubbornness, I think we can see a good definition if we go to 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. And this is, um, this is spoken directly to um, Saul, to King Saul. But... but but the reason I bring up is, is, is what, it, what does God call stubbornness? Listen to, as I read this verse. For rebellion, okay, so rebellion is, is one way that we define stubbornness. For rebellion against God. For rebellion is as the sin of divination. And insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you from being king. Okay, so what does God call stubbornness, rebellion, insubordination against his word, refusing to be obedient to the word of God, the command of God, the will of God? That's what stubbornness is. So if you have any area of your life where you're re that, that, that you're acting in insubordination against the will of our Lord, if you are standing in rebellion, that is sin that you are clutching onto and you are refusing to be reasoned with because the Word of God wants to reason with you. 
I want to reason with you as your pastor. I want to tell you, repent of your sin, turn away from it, and turn to God. But see, Mrs. Potiphar would not do that. She refused to do that, even when Joseph was pleading with her. But let us, as followers of Jesus Christ, not be like that. Let us be, be willing to have a brother or sister speak truth into our life, and let's be willing to listen to them and to pray and to change our ways. I think it's so important. All right, so number five, a person who is looking um, to, to sin. Mrs. Potiphar had a disrespectful attitude towards her husband. Look down at verse 14. It says that she called the men. Okay, she screams. Joseph runs out of her, her bedroom. Okay, um, she calls the men servant back into her house, and she says this to them. She says, he, referring to her husband, has brought this Hebrew into us to mock us, to make fun of us. All right, at that moment, she is shifting the blame from herself. She's shifting it to her husband. She's disrespecting her husband amongst the men um, servants of, of, of her house, showing great disrespect. Now, Paul says, Paul, to, to the church at, 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 at Ephesus, in chapter 5, verse 33, he says this. He's speaking to, to those, those young, newly married husbands and wives, and he says this first to the husbands. He says, husbands, love your own wife even as you, you love yourself. But then he turns to the wives, and he says this, And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. She respects her husband. What usually happens in a home when mom refuses to respect dad? There's discord, isn't there? There's discontentment in the home. No one's happy. You know what's interesting? is is the hardest thing for a man to do in the home, in a marriage, is to love his wife. It's so much easier for him to love himself, to love his toys, to love the things that he desires, but to love his wife is a sin that he must... Listen, he doesn't have the power, apart from God, to be able to battle um, the love of self. He has, to, he has to submit that to God and say, God, help me to love my wife as, as, as you love the church. And God will help him do it. But the same is true for a wife. What is the one thing that, that, that a woman has a difficult time doing? That's submitting to the will of her husband or submitting to the authority of her, of her husband. Um, and she, too, has, does not have the power to do that on her own. She has to turn to God, and God will give her the power to be able to do that. But Paul is, is preaching that, that, that there. Number six, Miss Potiphar had a lying tongue. She was a liar. She could not be trusted. You say, well, how do you know that? Okay, think about this, and we're going to look at this from, from two different perspectives very quickly. Number one, she is married to the chief executioner, all right? If she truly had been advanced upon by Joseph in the form of rape, the crime of rape, the chief executioner would have had Joseph's head removed from his body. But he didn't. He had Joseph thrown into the jail where he, he again, prospers there. He's blessed by the Lord, and he rises in position so that he is over all the other prisoners. Okay, would that have happened if, if perhaps Mr. Potiphar didn't truly trust his wife, if those within the house didn't truly trust her? Now, we could look at it from another perspective. Another angle would be that that perhaps it, it's not that at all. Perhaps it was that, you know, it was just God's sovereignty over the situation that God is working through Joseph's life in order to achieve greatness. I believe it's both. I believe that, yes, God was doing that. It was it was his um, authority. It was his sovereignty. But I believe also that um, Mrs. Potiphar was a liar, that that was part of her character, that people knew this to be true. And when this event happened, that uh, Mr. Potiphar knew something was, was up. Um, there is a movie put out, uh, a children's car cartoon about um, Joseph's life. Uh, it's not called, it's by DreamWorks Pictures. I think it's called The Dreamer, or it'll come to me in a minute. But anyways, it portrays um, Mrs. Potiphar as being a liar. And I think they do that very well in that movie. All right, so a person who is continually looking to sin. Number one, Mrs. Potiphar has an impressive position, has a wandering eye, has a lustful heart, um, has a stubborn will, will not listen to reason. Um, has a disrespectful attitude towards her husband, towards others in, in their lives, um, has a lying tongue, cannot be trusted. And number seven, Mrs. Potiphar is forgotten. She's forgotten. Other than these words recorded in Scripture, which, by the way, record her sin, record her downfall, who wants to be remembered for all of eternity in the pages of God's Scripture as something sinful that you did? You know, you want to be known for something good that, that, that you did. I want to be. I want to be. I don't want to be known for for the for for the ways that I sinned against God. I want to be known for the ways that I lived out my obedience towards Him. I want to be known. You know, I want, when I die, how do I want to be remembered as a man who loved the Lord, loved Jesus so much that He was willing to tell other people how they could be saved from their sin and know Jesus too. That's what I want to be known known as. How about you?
I believe you want to be known as someone who loves the Lord Jesus and who serves the Lord Jesus each and every day by giving of everything in, in your life. I pray that this Bible study was meaningful to you. Um, our application is to take those seven things and not to learn from Mrs. Potiphar, but rather to learn from Joseph, to flee from temptation, to be someone of great integrity, to allow God to build our character through making godly choices with our lives, with always choosing God and His way over um, the temptations of this world. I think that's very important. Let's close in prayer. And again, I want to thank you for being with me this evening. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this lesson. And Father, as we um, leave this place, may we continue to meditate it, meditate upon your word. And Father, allow it to shape us and transform us and to make us more into um, the likeness of Jesus Christ. Father, we love you. And until we meet again, we want to give you praise and glory with every breath that we take. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Well, church, I pray that you will join us on Sunday morning, Easter Sunday. We will have a special service recorded, and it will be available. We're going to try to have it available by 8 o'clock on Sunday morning. Um, posted to both our webpage. If you'll go down, scroll down on our homepage of sbcnahunta.org to the sermon box. Click on that, and then you can. it'll take you to our YouTube page, and you can click on our Easter Sunday morning service. But also, if you go to Southside Baptist Church Nahuna, our Facebook page, you can also watch, watch the sermon or the service. It's going to be the service because Dylan will be involved, and um, hopefully we'll have some specials and some things like that. But just want to encourage you to worship with us on Sunday morning. Hey, listen, get together as a family. Worship together as a family. It is okay to... To, to be creative in the way that you worship the Lord this particular Easter. The coronavirus cannot prevent us from worshiping a risen Savior today, tomorrow, and the days to come. I guarantee you that. All right, y'all have a good evening, and we'll see you real soon.